as Pastor Ray said, the theme for the month of March is the church being real, so the church being authentic and the church being genuine. How do you say it? Genuine? Genuine? Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, do you remember that saying, we need to take a good hard look at ourselves? I think that's what that means, does it? We need to take a good hard look at ourselves. How are we going on the reality scale? There's a lot of reality around these days, isn't there? And most of it's not reality, <laughs> is it? We've got like Instagram and Facebook, but you know, people only post on there what they want you to see, don't they? They don't post, you know, when they wake up in the morning and look like death warms up and feel terrible. That's not what they post. Do you know what I mean? So you only get to see, and you might look at that person and think, gee, I wish my life was like theirs. And if you knew the reality, you'd probably think, I'm glad my life is not like theirs. <laughs> um, reality TV, that's not real. Is it? Um, so, yeah, it's not reality. It's just a heavily edited version of reality. Um, so it doesn't hurt to ask ourselves the question, how real are we? I think it's a good thing to examine ourselves. There's so in the Bible. Um, in 2 Corinthians 13, we see Paul writing to the Corinthian church who um, are struggling at the time. And he says, test yourselves to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along, taking everything for granted. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need first-hand evidence, not be a hearsay that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. I hope the test won't show that we have failed, but if it comes to that, we'd rather the test showed our failure than yours. We're rooting for the truth to win out in you. We couldn't possibly do otherwise. We don't just put up with our limitations, we celebrate them and then go on to celebrate every strength, every triumph of the truth in you. We pray hard that it will come together in your lives. So they're seeking the truth. So they want to say, you know, it's not about appearances, it's not what you look like you're doing, how you look like you're going. Just have a good old look and see, you know, is there some things we need to work on? So they sound like pretty genuine people. They're not trying to pretend they're something that they're not. They're not hiding their faults and their shortcomings. But they're saying, you know, let's see how we're going. If we could be doing it better, let's do it better together. You know, let's let's not hide it. Let's be open and say, hey. So how do we gauge how we're going? What, what can we look at to see um, where we think we are? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> I think we could look at the fruit we're producing. That's a good place to start. Are we producing any fruit? And is it any good? Interesting question. The other day, Corey, when Corey was speaking, he was talking about Adam and Eve and how the Bible says sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and grace and righteousness came through one man, Jesus Christ. And Adam kind of gets the credit for the sin, but Eve handed him the apple, right? So what's that? <laughs> so just as you said that, this thought came into my head, Corey, and the thought was, what if Eve could see the world today? What if Eve could see the world today? Wow. What if we could see the fruit or consequences, or whatever you want to call it, of our actions before we did them? So now Eve, in her defense, she had no one else's life to look on. You know, she had no mum. That's weird. <laughs> she had no grandma. You know, she, she was just, there, there she was. Um, with just Adam, a bloke. And she had no example. 
literally she had, you know, we all have like friends, we have people in our lives. Eve had nobody. Poor everyone say, oh, poor Eve. <laughs> but here's one thing that I read in the Bible that I have never ever noticed in my life. Um when God gave that instruction about not eating from a certain tree in the garden, he actually told that to Adam before Eve was even created. Oh, I thought that was interesting. So God told Adam what not to do in um, Genesis 2 verse 17, and he didn't create Eve until verse 22. So when she said, here, honey, try this apple, he could have said, no, dear. That's not what we should be eating. There's plenty of other trees in this garden, probably vines and goodness knows what else. Let's put that one down and let's, you know, try something else. But no, he said, oh, and here we are today. So, Eve, I've got to go. <laughs> so, um, okay, I am turning 50 this year. Oh, my God. And... You know, as you get to these kind of ages, you really notice that time just flies, does it not? It's flying like crazy. And, you know, I thought just the past 10 years, just take a short 10 years. Like 10 years ago, our daughter Chloe was 11. She was only 11. And 10 short years later, she's 21. You could probably have worked that out. So, <laughs> but she got engaged, she got married, she moved to the farm, she moved from the farm to the city, she got herself a job, she's driving a car in the city, she's catching a bus. For my family, the bus is the more terrifying thing. But you know, you just have to blink and just another year's gone, isn't it? Like. It'll be Christmas again, like Ray said this morning, but we eat turkey again. Um, and, you know, one thing I've found out in life that it doesn't take long to pick up a habit or, you know, a mindset to, to get ingrained in, your, in there, but it can take years to unlearn things that aren't right. Is that true? I really feel God wants me to speak tonight about wisdom. Um, but wisdom in the sense of the church community, because that's what we are, the church family. That's being real with one another. One another. Um, we're sharing the things that we've learned and passed on what God has shown to us. And not, I don't mean in the sense of, I've got it all together, let me tell you what you're doing wrong. I don't mean that. I mean, I've walked through some stuff in my life that you may be walking through now. And can I help? That's what I mean. That's what I mean. So let's be real with each other. We can help each other. And others can help us if we open and we let our walls down. We don't have to make mistakes that others have gone before us have made. We can avoid them. Listen to the wisdom of others that has been born out of many years in the world and many years in the Word as well. If you'll be teachable and listen, you can save yourself some really unnecessary trouble and heartache in your life. Job 12 verse 12 says, Wisdom belongs to the aged and understanding to the old. So young people, you need to do less eye rolling and more listening. Because you gain wisdom from being in the wealth for so many years. Look how wise Pastor Ray is. <laughs> so wise. When we were first married, 30 years ago this year, um, boy, did we waste the money. Oh, Lord, did we waste the money. Not that we had an awful lot of it, but what we had, we wasted. My goodness. You cry if you see and think about it. You know, but, but 
it wasn't until, you know, we moved here to Port Pirie. I was 25, so half my life ago. Um, it's half my life in Port Pirie. Um, and we sat under the wisdom of Pastor Mark and Helen. And if you have trouble with your finances, <laughs> I tell you what, we turned things around because they taught us how to manage what we had, how to put God first in our finances. And, you know, we had to come and we had to, it was so embarrassing. We had to bring, we bought all our bills, we bought all our credit card statements, all of them, and our bank account statements, which were very sad. And you've got to, you've got to be open. We had to lay it all out there on the table and be real about it. You know, what makes them so wise? Why are they so good? Why should we go to them? Because they've had their own money issues. At the start of their married life, they got in some big holes as well. And they got out of them with the help of God. And that's why we went to them. And, you know, with God's help and with their wise counsel, things have turned around. Praise God. <laughs> you know, when we're going through something, it's smart to find someone, some wise Christian counsel. counsel. Someone who's been in the same dark hole you find yourself in. And by the grace of God, you can get out of it. <laughs> they are the people that we need to be listening to in our lives. If we think about it, we can sometimes see the fruit of other people's decisions in our own life, can't we? And at times it can be painful, but it can serve as a tough lesson as we walk our own path. Maybe, maybe at this stage of your life you can see the effects of some parenting styles that they've had on your life and you can then make the decision that you're going to do things differently in your family. Maybe you've been betrayed by a friend. Maybe someone's broken your confidence and so now you know what that feels like and you can go ahead and not do that in your own life. Consequences of our choices and decisions are not always bad, though. So I read about um, the evangelist Reinhard Bonnke, who was saved at nine years of age. And I just thought of his parents, you know, the decisions that they made along the way, the commitment of being God first in their home, um, the commitment of being a godly example to their son. And it's a commitment. It's an every day. If you're a parent, you know it's an every day decision. It's not as easy as it sounds, but who could have predicted the fruit of their decisions to put God first in their home? You know, Reinhard passed away at the end of last year and the estimated number of salvations from his ministry is somewhere in the vicinity of 79 million. Wow. That, that just puts a lot of weight on those everyday decisions that parents had to make you know, as, as he was a little boy. I'm sure he was the best. When I, when I say learn from others, I don't only mean learn from their mistakes. You can learn from their victories as well. Listen to people who have had their prayers answered. Take note of people's praise reports and their testimonies and learn from them and glean from them. What, you know, If God's done it for them, he'll do it for you. What about Josiah? He is like a little sponge, isn't he? <laughs> he wants to learn from everybody. He's coming early to church, learning how to set up. You know, he comes in on Mondays to the office and says, what can I do for you? Let me do it. He wants to do jobs. He wants to help us. He wants to do things. And he's just hanging around with Pastor Mark, Pastor Ray, and Pastor Shane, and Corey, and he just wants to learn and glean and, you know, everything that God's got, he wants. And Pastor Daniel, if you're watching, you'll be proud of him. He's a great disciple. <laughs> and how good was last week's communion? My goodness. Dude didn't even have any notes. Look at me. I've got like 15 pages. I'm only 50. 
I'm actually not, I'm 40. So what is it about Josiah? Is it his skill? Is it his talent? Is his charming good look? It might be all of these things. <laughs> but I'll tell you what it is. It's his hunger and thirst for everything that God has. And it's his willingness. And it's his desperation for Jesus. And, you know, he's not afraid to show that. He's being a light and not being hidden under a bowl. Okay. And he knows God's word, which is good. You know, Eve came directly into a world without sin and deception. Didn't she? So maybe she wasn't quite um, aware of the concept that somebody might try and um, trick her with clever words. You know, twisting ever so slightly what God said to her. The concept of one degree of difference at the start can mean we end up miles off from where God intended for us to be. I saw this illustration. Um, 1979, a passenger jet carrying 257 people left New Zealand for a sightseeing flight to Antarctica and back. Um, unknown to the pilots, however, there was a minor two-degree error in the flight coordinates, which just happened to put them into the path of a mountain. And that was the end of all of those people. Because once they got to their destination, they were 28 miles off where they should have been. So by one degree, after one foot, you'll miss your target by 0.2 inches, which is next to nothing. After 100 yards, you'll be off by 5.2 feet. You can tell <laughs> Not huge, but noticeable. After a mile, you'll be off by 92 feet. So the one degree is really starting to make a difference. If you veer off course by one degree, flying around the equator, you'll end up almost 500 miles off your target, and that's about from here to Melbourne. So the point here is that small actions accumulated over a very long time make a huge difference. What the serpent said to Eve, I mean, was it really that far off what God had said? It was pretty close, wasn't it? Or was it? What would she say if she could see the world today? We need to stay in the word so we know it well. We need to stay close to God so we know the voice of his spirit and listen to it. And guard your heart, always guard your heart. Consequences are not always negative. There's consequences of not making a decision or a commitment. But not making a decision is kind of just making a decision to do nothing. <laughs> is that right? If you just procrastinate. Um, who likes gardening here? Anyone like gardening? We hate gardening. <laughs> we hate it. But we love having a nice, tidy garden. We really like it. But there's no point sitting inside in our reclining electric armchairs. <laughs> wishing we had a nice garden. You've got to get out there and do something about it. But like every day, just get those few weeds, mow the lawn. Mowing the lawn is something I've never done because I don't know how. Um, yes, you do. Do a good job. So, you know, if you want something to turn out nice, you've got to make regular decisions towards that thing. Look at David. In 1 Samuel 17, I thought Ray was going to steal my scripture last week when he said 1 Samuel 17. So David, when he was still in the um, paddock, wasn't old enough yet to join his brothers in the army. So, you know, while they went off the war, so he had to stay behind and look after his father's sheep. Boring. So his dad asked him to take food out to his brothers. And you can imagine a teenager today, because he was about a teenager. Whatever, let them do it. Why should I take their lunch? You know, but if David didn't do the mundane thing and take his brother's um, food, the David Goliath story never would have happened. Stephen Furtick tells it like this. Jesse, David's dad, asked David to take some bread and cheese out to his brothers on the battlefield, which is a pretty low task. 
he's not old enough to go to the paddock himself. He just had to do an Uber Eats run and deliver the food to the really important people. But if he hadn't been obedient and done that minor, seemingly unimportant thing, being faithful to his father, doing what he was asked, he wouldn't have seen and heard what he did, which led him to defeat that giant. So not only was it a triumph in his day, but David has provided inspiration for millions of Christians down the track, like including myself, for story, you know, situations in our own life. And you know, not only that, non Christians also relate to the David and Goliath story. People that don't even believe in him. You know, like if God's on your side, which he is, there's nothing you can't do. Nothing you can't do. Those are some consequences I bet that he didn't consider. The impact of the mundane everyday thing. The decisions that make all the difference later on. So about our church getting real, it's about community. It's about being here for one another, helping one another, encouraging one another, sharing experiences and how God has brought us through and allowing others to speak into our lives. If we're getting real, you know, sometimes we have to admit that the way we've been living our lives hasn't always brought about the greatest What's that old saying? Definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and experiencing and expecting different results. We may need to change some things, some habits, some routines if we want to see things change in our life. You know, don't try to change everything at once because that never works. You know, some people make New Year's resolutions and they think, right, on on the 1st of January, I'm going to go on a diet, going to lose weight, going to get fit, I'm going to um, mow the lawn, (laughs) I'm going to spend more time with my kids and get more rest. And then by 4 o'clock on the first day, they're like, no, I'm done. (laughs) I'm done. Just pick one thing. Just pick one thing for starters. What's going to make the biggest difference in your life? Something like spending more time in God's Word would probably be a good place to start. We can be transformed. Transformed. Who wants to be transformed? I do. (laughs) By the renewing of your mind. You know, my mind can be crazy sometimes. I need more of God's Word in there and less of mine. (laughs) You know, my mind can be ruled by my emotions sometimes. Um, I can get offended for stupid reasons and I can get annoyed for different stupid reasons and I can get irritated for no reason at all. I'm clever like that. But the thing about that is that people go on to make decisions out of that, don't they, out of that chaos and that's not good. We need some wisdom. We need to be smacked upside the head with some godly truth. Otherwise, our life is a series of one dumb decision after the other, and we're getting nowhere. We're supposed to be going from glory to glory, and instead we can be going from pothole to pothole, not getting anywhere. And contrary to what you may think, it won't take years and years and years of studying the Bible to, to make a change. No, his word is God breathed and the breath of God is life. The breath of God is powerful. In Psalms, by the breath of God, the heavens were made. In Ezekiel, by the breath of God, the dry bones came to life. In Job, the breath of God gives life and it gives understanding. Scripture is God breathed. It doesn't take long to impact your world with the truth. It doesn't take long to realize what you've been believing and what you've been declaring over your situation is not helping. And once you know the truth of the word, you start to pray it and believe it and declare it, you will see things begin to change. 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the message says, there's nothing like the written word of God showing you the way to salvation through faith, faith in Christ Jesus. Every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us the truth, 
exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped for the tasks that God has for us. God's word is truth, and it is just as true in your mouth as it is in anybody else. Once you start to apply godly wisdom to your life, you will never be the same. Seek counsel. Seek out others you know will give you godly advice, but there's no substitute for knowing the word of God for yourself. Start with that. Start with a reading plan. The Bible app on your phone, that's got like hundreds of different reading plans in it. Start with a word for the day out there on the thing by the thing. Start with something. Um, 21 days of prayer and fasting, as I shared before, I fasted Dr. Phil because uh, <laughs> when I'm doing housework and, and things, I put Dr. Phil on my YouTube on my phone, put it in my pocket, and then I go about doing my housework. It helps me get my housework watching Dr. Phil, which I really like. So I felt like God, <laughs> I felt like there was something better. You know, so for the 21 days of prayer, a pastor Mike actually just said 21 days of prayer. So I thought, oh, yeah, prayer. And then and then he announces that it's fasting as well. And I'm like, I didn't know. So I thought, you know, what can I fast? This food doesn't work great for me. So I fasted my Dr. Phil and I replaced it. I swapped it out with Stephen Furtick's sermons. And he's so good. Nothing wrong with Dr. Phil, by the way. I really like him. But I can feel the word of God bring me through. There's nothing quite like squeezing a little extra scripture into your day. Proverbs 24 says, Wise people are builders. They build families, businesses, community. And through intelligence and insight, their enterprises are established and endure. Because of their skilled leadership, their hearts of people, the hearts of people are filled with the treasures of wisdom and the pleasures of spiritual wealth. Wisdom can make anyone into a mighty warrior, and revelation knowledge increases strength. Wise strategy is necessary to wage war, and with many astute advisors, you'll see the path to victory more clearly. Isn't that? Many astute advisors, that's what I've been talking about. Christian counsel. Sounds like some really godly counsel. You might be living your consequences now. Living in the results of decisions that you've made in the past. They may not be great, but you can never mess up so bad that God can't use you, that God, you know, can't bless you. Look at the prodigal son. He was living in his consequences, and as he realized it and acknowledged it, he turned to head back to his father's house. And what did his father do? Did he say, Wow, you're an idiot and a half. What a mess you've made of your life. Wasted my money. Is that what he said? No. He ran to meet him. He didn't say, oh, what? Oh. He saw him while he was a long way off and he ran to meet him. Couldn't wait for him to get home. He didn't care what he'd done. He didn't care what state he was in. He didn't care that he was poor because he'd squandered all his money. He didn't care that he stank from hanging around the pit. He was just really, really, really happy to have him home. And all the things the son had wasted, the things he'd lost because of his bad decision, his father provided. Didn't he? he provided clothes, not just any clothes, but the best clothes. He provided food and not just the leftovers or the, the pig food like he was expecting. He killed the fatted calf. That's the best food that he had. And the sand for his feet meant he was a son, not just a servant. And the ring for his finger, a sign of honour and position. So, you know, he was only going to beg to to be given the position of, you know, a hired help, like a farm hand. But his father wasn't concerned with what he'd done. He was just so happy he was coming home. He'd been lost for so long, and now he was found. Mess or no mess, at least he had his child back. 
What a loving father. And this is a picture of our loving father God. He can use us even in our greatest mess. He can do anything with us if we turn our lives back to him. You know, God showed me a picture of a little child and he had like a jigsaw puzzle. But the child was only little and the jigsaw puzzle had like 10,000 pieces of something. You know, like way beyond above what his capability were. And so, he, you know, he might have got two pieces together over here, maybe a couple of the corners and a bit in the middle. But he, he couldn't do it and he got so frustrated and he just threw the whole lot up in the air and pieces went everywhere. And he said, I can't. So he threw, threw a tantrum <laughs> and, you know, his dad just came and just gently picked up all from back into the box, put the child onto his lap and said, let's do this together. Let's do this together. You can't do it on your own. Let me show you where every piece Every scattered piece goes in the puzzle of your life. Let's do it together. And you know, the child learns that his dad is always there. Always there. Mess or no mess, good times and bad, his dad is always there. God can do so much with your mess if you hand it to him. Only if you hand it to him. So church, it's time to get real. It's time to stop pretending that we've got it all together. If things are going well for you, excellent. It's time to look around. Not everyone is going through an easy season. Who can you come alongside of? Who can you reach out to? It might be as simple as offering a listening ear. Sometimes that's all it takes for people to realise they're not going through this alone. If we're struggling, it's time to ask for help. It's not a sign of failure. It's actually a sign of wisdom. Because God put us here in this family, in this community, to help each other. We're a body. And, you know, like the Bible says, one part of the body can't say to another part, I don't need you. Everyone is a part of the body. Maybe you need someone to help you pick up the pieces of that puzzle and put them back into the box and take you to, to the feet of Jesus. I, want, I just want everyone to close their eyes now and bow their heads. We're just going to pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it teaches us, directs us, and guides us, and that it paints a picture of what a loving, good, good father you really are. We thank you that you placed us into your family where everyone belongs and no one is left out. I pray tonight, God, that you would help us to take an honest look at our own lives. Holy Spirit, show us where we need to reach out to others. Help us to listen and be willing to step out as you direct us. And Father, may you give us the courage to speak up when we are in need when we are struggling and find it hard to see a way out of the situation or the season that we find ourselves in. And may we all remember the father to the prodigal son was so thrilled to have his son home. No matter what a mess he'd made of his life, God, you just want to love us, to embrace us and to call us your child, your son, your daughter, because that's exactly what we are. So we hand over the pieces of our puzzle to you, Father God. We hand over the reins and say, have your way in us, Lord. Build us and make us into the church you see, a real, genuine body of people all across the earth, loving others just as you love us. In the mighty and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Wow. Yeah, give Kelly a hand.
They were some pretty wise words, weren't they? For a young lady like yourself. You know, I can see what, what God's trying to do, not just with our church, but with his, with his bride. And that's bring us together as a, as a community, as a body, so that, we're, so that we're there for each other. And I really sense that he's, he's asking us just to knock away the wall, start, start trusting again, you know? You may have been hurt. I know I have. You know, when you, you do, you start to put walls. I think God's calling us to put those things aside, put down, the, put down the walls, and let's build some good, strong relationships. Amen? And that's, that's the idea of what we want to start to do next, next week. You know, get alongside each other. Get, along, get into some, we're going to leave these tables out. Get into some tables with some people that you wouldn't normally sit with. And get to know them. Get to know their story. Let them get to know your story, who you are, where you've come from. That's what we need to do, isn't it? That's what community does. And from that, well, that's what, what Kelly was saying. We, we get to help each other. We get to stand alongside each other. Wow, I didn't know you were going through that. Let's want to stand with you. Amen? Good on you. Thank you so much, Kelly. For your great word. and. Um, Listen, we're going to call it a night. Don't rush off. And you, and all those guys and girls that help us normally clean up or take the table.